Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. We are. We truly do call it an honor and a privilege and a blessing to be able to assemble together and allow Holy Spirit to teach us. Amen. Amen. So tonight we got a little treat, and we're probably going to be doing this on, in this setting into the beginning of the year. Then we're going to integrate something else. Um, but for those who don't know, those who are watching us live, we do appreciate you coming on and being a part of what God is doing here at Ambassador's Assembly. Um, but for those who don't know, Pastor Joel has just come along with us and partnered with us to start the apologetics aspect of the ministry. And I'll let him explain what apologetics is and, and him kind of dig into his background just briefly. And then we're going to get into one of the questions or one of the topics that was given to us by the congregation. And what we do is um, we take questions that people may have about the faith, um, whether it's questions um, concerning the faith or questions that challenge the faith or whatever it may be, our job and our goal is to equip everybody who want to have a seat at the table with God to be able to learn more about the faith. Amen? Amen. So the question that we're, uh, that we have on tonight that was asked by some of our peers is one that I believe has been debunked over and over again, but you know, people want to know, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna answer them. Sounds right? good. Amen. Amen. So, uh, is is Christianity the white man's religion? Um, um, we understand that that there have been people that have used the Bible the wrong way, but does that mean that their use of it makes the Bible a falsehood? Uh, but before we get into that, Joel, I have a few questions Certainly. Uh, myself that I think uh, people need to know. And what is Christianity? Let's, let's okay. define what it means to be a Christian and, and when was Christianity birthed Absolutely. biblically. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll start off real quick and uh, give a quick explanation of apologetics and okay. my background, and then I'd be happy to... Um, answer that question. Uh, yes, I'm Joel Wildberger. Um, I was called from a young age to uh, apologetics to the ministry when I was like 15. And apologetics uh, obviously has nothing to do with the word apologize. It comes from the Greek word apologia. Um, apologia just means reason, defense. It's a Greek word. And as we know, the New Testament was written in Greek. Um, so my background, uh, you know, as soon as I was called to ministry, uh, I was just overwhelmed by the amount of evidence for Christianity. It was incredible uh, because I was taught, you know, certain things like science and religion don't mix, right? But if God created the universe, the whole universe should point to him. And, and that's what I found. Um, and so I, I started studying at the age of 15, and I eventually did uh, a degree in religion at Baylor University. Uh, I did my seminary degree at Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and I focused on Greek New Testament and worldview and apologetics or philosophy and I um, uh, just finished at Yale University doing uh, philosophy of religion um, that was that was my focus there uh, so you know the question what is Christianity you always hear people say Christianity is not a, a religion it's a relationship right it's a relationship with God because we've been uh, brought into unity with God through Christ we're unified uh, in Christ through his death his life becomes our life, and his death becomes our death to sin, right? Uh, you know, his, uh, historically in, in academia, Christianity is considered one of the great three Abrahamic religions, along with Judaism and Islam. But uh, Christianity itself um, is made up of those who have placed their faith in Christ as their Lord and Savior. Uh, that's what makes a Christian. Uh, the word church is used two ways uh, theologically. You have the local church, which is made up of believers and unbelievers, right? There are plenty of people in the church who, you know, they just come on Sunday and they say, I'm a Christian, but they don't have a real relationship with Christ. Uh, as Jesus said, in the last day, there will be many who come to me saying, Lord, Lord, I did these things in your name. And he will say, flee from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. So the interesting thing about that verse is, first of all, uh, in the Greek, 
when it says Lord, Lord, uh, there wasn't punctuation in Greek, right? So to emphasize something, they didn't have an exclamation point. They would repeat words. That's why God is called holy, 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 to emphasize the holiness of God. And that's actually the only word that's repeated three times to describe God. But when people come to Jesus in the last day and say, Lord, Lord, they, these are people who claim to be Christians, right? Mm. But it's not about whether they say they knew Jesus. Jesus says, I never knew you. And so how do we... How do, how do we define Christianity? Well, the, the universal church, the true church, is only made up of believers. That's the universal church. And so, you know, um, it might be a bit simplistic to describe Christianity as a relationship, but it's, that's true. Those who are unified with Christ in his death are Christians, those who believe in him. You know, in, in uh, John 3, the most famous verse, John 3, 16, um, a, a really good literal translation is, for God so loved the world in order that. There's a, what's called a henna clause there. It's a purpose. God loved the world mm. with a purpose yeah. um, in order that all the believing ones, those who believe, right? It's usually translated whosoever, but all the believing ones should not perish. Um, so who are the Christians? The ones that are believing in Christ. Mm. And so that's, that's what Christians are. And, of course, you know, you know a Christian by their fruit, right? First John says you will know them by their fruits. Um, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, but I, I hear you say the word believing and not believe. Yes, yeah, right. We talked about this, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, there's something called an aspect in, in Greek, and uh, the, the present tense in Greek often conveys an ongoing action. So a lot of people think, hey, I went to you know, Bible, vacation Bible school when I was 13, and I said a quick prayer, and I got my ticket checked, and I'm good. Right, but but John often uses this present tense, and it's believing. It's an ongoing action. Mm. Um, so, you know, um, uh, it's it's not funny. It's sad. Uh, when when I was uh, ministering at a church in Kentucky, when I was in seminary, they had these group called Candy Bar Christians. And you're like, what is a Candy Bar Christian? <laughs> and so they had vacation Bible school, and they would literally tell the kids, "If you accept Jesus into your heart, we'll give you a candy bar." What kid's not? Wow. What kid's not gonna? Yeah. You know, be like, I'll, I'll take Jesus, right? And yeah. So I want my <laughs> yeah. candy bar. And yeah. It, 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 Christianity is is a real abiding relationship with Christ, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I believe fully in the the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. Those who are truly in Christ will stay in Christ. So a, a true Christian, they might have periods of backsliding, we sin, but if you're truly in Christ. You remain in Christ. Christ says, I know my sheep. I'm in the Father's hands, and they are mine. None can snatch them away. Um, and, and Jesus also said in John 6, I come not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And the will of him who sent me is to um, lose none of them. He doesn't lose any of them that are given to him. Um, so if you're in Christ, you stay in Christ because your sins have been forgiven and your heart has been changed. You've been reborn. And so... You know, to define Christianity as just a religion is, is also a bit simplistic. It's, it's about a new life, a new change that we have that's being regenerate, being born again, being in Christ, if that makes sense. Now, you know, Joel, for the believer, we know that, that um, Scripture is the final authority to all matters of Absolutely. the Christian life. Uh, so we know as believers, all we need is the word. Yes. But, but when we encounter somebody who's not a believer mm -hmm. and, and they, they make statements like it's, it's Christianity, you know, Christianity, white man religion, um, they use, they, they force this on us. It was invented at the Council of Nicaea. Mm -hmm. The character Jesus is not a real guy, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, but before we get into this biblically, are, are there any type of references outside of Scripture that points to Scripture? Yes, and I, and I, lo I love the way you, you formed that question initially, that the, the Bible is, is sufficient. So the Bible claims for itself in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that, that it is sufficient. It uses this Greek word artios, which can, can be translated as, as sufficient. But, but interestingly, the Bible doesn't claim to be the only authority, right? It claims to be mm, the final, final. That's authority, good. right? That's and good. the only infallible, perfect authority because it literally is the word of God. It, Paul uses this word theanustas, and he literally takes the word theos, which means God, and breath, pneuma, and crams them together and makes a new word, which is God-breathed. The Bible's God-breathed. So is there anything else that we have that is God-breathed, that is God's actual word? No. So it's the final authority, but God set up the church as an authority, the government as an authority, your parents as an authority, but can mm. those can those 
authorities fail and err? Of course they of can, course, right? Yeah. But does the Bible? No. So history, um, you know, is our historiography. That's that's a great source for us to look at, and um, there are a lot. So specifically with the New Testament, when we're talking about Jesus and trying to answer this question. Uh, there are extra biblical sources that discuss Jesus. You would imagine that if Jesus wasn't a real historical figure that we wouldn't have extra biblical writings about Jesus, but we do. Um, for instance, Josephus, the Jewish historian, I'll actually, and what I want to do um, is read you some primary sources. So the original sources, um, I guess the earliest one I want to read you, uh, there, was, there was a Roman uh, governor named Pliny, Pliny the Younger, I believe, and he was writing to Emperor Trajan, the Emperor mm. of Rome, and and this is, gosh, this is um, either late first century or early second century. So he's asking Trajan, "What do I do about these these Christians? Mm. They're not saying Kaiser Curia, Caesar is Lord. They're saying Jesus is Lord. Uh, so so what do I, what do I do about these people?" And uh, Pliny writes to Trajan, It is my practice, my lord, to refer you to all matters of which I am in doubt. For who better can give guidance to my hesitation or inform my ignorance? I have never before participated in the trials of Christians. So I do not know what offenses are to be punished or investigated or to what extent. Uh, so he goes on. Uh, Meanwhile, in the case of those who are denounced to me as Christians, I have followed the following procedure. I interrogated them as to whether they were Christians. Those who confessed, I interrogated a second and a third time, threatening to them um, with punishment. Those who persisted, I ordered executed. For I had no doubt that whatever the nature of their creed, stubbornness, or inflexible obstinacy, surely they deserve to be punished. There were others who possessed, persisted in the same folly. But because they were Roman citizens, I sent them to Rome. Um, and he goes on. Those who denied that they had been Christians when they, were, when they invoked gods in words dictated by me offered prayer and incense and wine to your image, Kaiser Curios, right? Mm-hmm. Caesar's Lord, which I had ordered to be brought uh, for this purpose together, the statues of gods, and also to curse Christ. Wow. And listen, this is the interesting thing. And he says, and also to curse Christ. None of those uh, who are really Christians can, it is said, be forced to do. So he even says that early. Those who are really Christians, no matter what, they won't curse Christ, even wow. unto death. And, and we see, um, actually, throughout uh, the history of martyrdom, um, interestingly, when uh, Christianity was brought to Japan, they would uh, place images of Jesus in front of Christians, and they would, they would ask them to step on the image of Christ. And the Christians would refuse to do so, even at the punishment of horrific death. Um, so, you know, if, if Jesus was this made-up figure that didn't really exist, why, why do we have these non-biblical accounts? And so the other one I wanted to read was um, a Jewish historian. Again, not a Christian. His name is uh, Josephus. I'm sure you've heard of him. Uh, we have two accounts of him speaking of Christ. Um, the first one... Uh, I believe, uh, let's see, it's from his Testimonium Flavinium. Now, here, here's the thing when you're doing history. You need to be fair. You need to be objective. So this account of him um, describing Jesus, I think there are Christian interpolations in it, meaning I think early Christians added to it. So I'll read you what he said, because if, if he wrote all of this, uh, he probably would have been a Christian. So I'll read you the larger portion, and then I'll read you the smaller portion, which is what he most likely wrote. He says, About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man, for he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people to accept truth gladly. He won them over, many Jews and many Greeks. He was the Christ. And when upon accusation of the principal men among us, Pilate and Pilate had condemned him to the cross. Mm. Those who had first come to love him did not cease. He appeared to them spending a third day restored to life. For the prophets of God foretold these things and a thousand other marvels about him. And the tribe of Christians so-called after him has still to this day not disappeared. And so that's, that's a non-Christian source describing yeah. uh, Jesus. Uh, if, if he was a myth, the uh, position is called a mythicist, somebody who doesn't think Jesus actually lived. Why do we have a Jewish historian describing this this figure? It, it wouldn't make any 
since. And so um, parts of that uh, obviously have Christian markings on them. It, it looks like um, parts of that a Christian added to it. Uh, so um, let's see. James Dunn, um, a well-known New Testament historian, um, said without those Christian interpreta- interpolations, uh, Josephus's writings probably would have looked more like this. Now, there was about that time G- a man named Jesus, a wise man, for he was a doer of startling deeds. That's referring to his miracles, right? A teacher of mm-hmm. such men as to receive the truth with pleasure. And he gained a following both among many Jews and many of Greek origin. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at first did not forsake him. And the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct to this day. So that's probably what he actually wrote. But we have no doubt that Josephus, a Jewish historian who was not a Christian, discusses Jesus, writes about Jesus, and was aware of this figure. So, so the, the idea from a historical standpoint that Jesus didn't actually exist, that's, that's laughable. I mean, yeah. it's just, just too much evidence. Yeah. And then we have Tacitus and Suetonius and other historians discussing yeah. him. Um, you know, we could be here all night reading them, but those are, those are two of the most prominent examples. Uh, there's, just, there's simply no doubt that uh, Jesus was an actual figure who lists even, uh, even the the New Testament um, textual critic Bart Ehrman, who is not a Christian, um, wrote a book about this mythicist position. He, he, he describes himself as a happy agnostic, and he says that there's, there's no doubt Jesus existed. It, it's, it's, from a historical perspective, it's, it's, it's a baffling claim, to be honest. So, now, these writings, do they uh, predate the Council of Nicaea? Yes. Yes, they do. Mm. All of them. All of them predates. The yes, Council of that I just read to you. Yes. So let's break this down in layman term. I was born in 1983. If somebody says no, I was born in 1989, but my grandmother wrote a letter to my mom in 1985, saying I had to beat Ryan bad self because he just be writing on the wall. And somebody 2,000 years later catch those letters, they can prove that I was born before 1989. You see what I'm saying? So basically, these writings are non-biblical. Right? Mm-hmm. They're not by Christians. No. And they predate the Council of Nicaea. Yes. So, you know, in, in our notion, that's very simple to, to debunk the Council of Nicaea, but we know that there are people in this age that are still holding firm to that notion that the characters of the Bible was birthed at the Council of Nicaea. So let me ask you this. Was the Council of Nicaea a real factual Event. thing that happened Absolutely. and if it was what really was it then if it okay. wasn't there to create the characters of the bible and use the bible as a tool of control right um so you know there are and i i don't maybe it's because the council of nicaea is the most well-known early church council uh we see the council of jerusalem in uh the new testament but uh, Act 16 yes mm-hmm. um so the, the, the Council of Nicaea probably is the most important church council. And Protestants and evangelicals like ourselves, except the first six or seven ecumenical councils um, that happened in the early church. And an ecumenical council is different from a local council. Like if we had the Council of Mobile, it would be from churches all around Mobile, right? But an ecumenical council is where the whole church comes together. So people from the east and people from the west and all over, they came together. And you can really see what the controversies of the, the, the period are by what the council is discussing, right? And so was the council discussing, is this person, Jesus, a real person? No, no. Was the council discussing, another, another myth is that the Council of Nicaea uh, declared what the biblical canon was, canon, C-A-N-O-N. And that's, those are the books that belong in um, the Bible, right? Um, canon is, is it means rule. Um, so the Council of Nicaea was about an early heresy uh, called Arianism. And Arius denied that Jesus was God. He said he was the first and greatest created being. And so the question that people would always ask was, is there a time when Jesus was not? So if there was a time when Jesus was not, it means he was created at some point. And so the Council of Nicaea is all about the divinity of Jesus. Uh, and mm. I'll, I'll read the uh, Nicene Creed. This is the creed that comes out of uh, Nicaea. Let's see. 
But uh, just to give you a bit of background, too, uh, it, it's like this, it's conspiratorial to think that all these people got together to plan out Jesus in the Bible and all this stuff. Uh, the, the church, uh, up until the um, Edict of Toleration, was a religio illicitus. It was a persecuted religion. So as um, one of my church professors told me, people you know, came to the Council of Nicaea and they were missing arms and eyes and, wow. and they were beat up and, uh, you know, because the church was persecuted for it the first 300 years. Now, often the persecution was sporadic, but the great persecution at the hands of uh, Domitian um, happened right before the Council of Nicaea. And uh, it was the Edict of Toleration um, that declared Christianity a religio licitus, a legal religion, and then the Edict of Milan um, by Constantine, uh, he said that we should create, uh, we should treat Christians benevolently, and then Christianity didn't even become the state religion until 380 at the Edict of Thessalonica. So, you know, for 300 years or so, Christianity was sporadically and then heavily persecuted. And so the Nicene Creed, um, this is what it, it reads. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten of his Father, of substance of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made. Okay, so that's your, that's your clue in mm. as to what they were, were arguing about. There was never a time when Jesus was not. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, right? Um, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance or essence, usias, um, with the Father, by whom all things were made, both which are in heaven and in earth, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate and was made man. <clears throat> he suffered in the third day, he rose again and ascended into heaven, and he shall come again to judge both the quick and the dead. So those who are alive and those who are dead. And we believe in the Holy Ghost. And whoever shall say that there was a time when the Son of God was not, or that before him, before he was begotten, he was not, or that he was made of things that were not, or that he is of a different substance or essence from the Father, we're using Trinitarian language here, one essence, three persons, right? Or that he is a creature, so he's created, or subject to change, all um, or subject to change or conversion, all that to say the Catholic and uh, Catholic being universal church and apostolic church anathematizes or damns them. Um, and uh, let me zone in on that word real quick. All that to say the Catholic and apost apostolic church. Catholic, if you just, if you read the early church fathers, you're not talking about Roman Catholic. Uh, it's the word Catholic. Yeah, uh, mm. Catholic means universal. So the living body of believers. Remember, we talked about the local church and the universal, universal, church. universal church here, right? So the, the universal church and apostolic, and when they say apostolic, they're tracing back their beliefs to the 12 apostles, right? Those who Jesus had given authority to anathematizes or um, damns, that's, that's a Greek word, um, anathematizes or damns them. And then if you want to see more about uh, the Council of Nicaea, they put out 20 general canons or rules, and none of them have anything to do with what books belong in the Bible, and none of them have anything to do with whether Jesus existed or not. It's, it's bizarre to think they had been persecuted for the name of Christ <laughs> uh, and then got together to invent Christ. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, what you're saying, Joel, it makes sense. I mean, uh, even when we look at the, the conversion of Paul, there had to be something that had to take place that that caused this radical transformation. Absolutely. I mean, you're looking at a man who had religious prestige. Mm. You know, he was he was honored. You know, as a as a, as a king, as royalty, basically, uh, in that time, as being a teacher of the law. Yeah, you know, seriously. trained by Gamaliel, and to to take all that and throw it aside mm -hmm. to be persecuted. I, 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 I mean, mean, that that had to be something happened. Yeah, and I mean, he was he was a persecutor of Christians as well. Yeah, exactly. So. And, and, and in a matter of three days now, transformation. So, I mean, that's, that's biblical evidence there that something mm -hmm. had to happen. I mean, even Peter. 
Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Peter went back after he denied Christ. Peter went back to fishing. People mm -hmm. followed him. Then all of a sudden he left that. And, and now he's standing before 3,000 men plus women and children yeah. being added to the church and declaring that Jesus is Lord. You yeah. know? And, and when we look at our personal lives, I mean... You know, I can say for myself, that's been a radical transformation in the last 10 years. I'm not the same man I used to be. Something Absolutely. happened yes. that was beyond my ability and control, mm -hmm. you know, me yielding to mm -hmm. it by faith and something that I don't see, mm -hmm. can't smell, touch, yeah. feel. And, and all of a sudden it empowers me to walk away from something that I've been involved in since I was 12. I mean, mm -hmm. come on. Yeah. You know, that's supernatural there. Absolutely. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah. And the, the, the thing about the New Testament is you, you see these these transformations, but during the time that they were written, people could go to them and they could speak to them. And you could speak to people who had actually seen Jesus and seen the resurrected Jesus. And so, um, you know, people, people will argue, oh, I, I've had to change life from, you know, uh, Islam or whatever. But... But uh, interestingly, the Quran uh, is it's not a historical work. It, it, it doesn't take place in time and space. The traditions about Muhammad are in the Hadith literature, um, but, but the, the ancient gospels, they're, they're bioi, they're biographies, right? And so mm. um, wow. there's, this, there's this spiritual element to it that, that, that we are all privy to because we've been transformed. But there's also this incredible... Um, historical element that flows alongside the spiritual testimony, and, you, and, and Paul talks about, and he appeared to the 500, and some are now asleep or dead. Uh, was it 500? I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. That's right. On, on when he appeared yeah, to and everybody. First Corinthians, and I think when he talks about yeah, 500. It. Yeah, and he appeared, and some some you can go speak to, right? We yeah. we have this incredible historical element um, to the life and person of Jesus that you just don't see in other world religions. It's incredible, um, and that's that's not to, to undermine any spiritual testimony. Um, it's just it, it it bolsters the spiritual testimony. You know what I mean? So in 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 your your in your opinion, what what do, so what what do we do with a, a, a Bible mm -hmm. that has as we know historically been tampered with? to be used as control. We know that people have, have uh, used the Bible, taken things out the Bible. We know mm -hmm. the slave Bible that, that they have now in, yeah. in, um, in libraries and things of that mm -hmm. nature that took out Exodus and anything mm -hmm. that, that, that shows God delivering his people from bondage. And mm -hmm. they, they, they left in um, slaves obey your master things of that nature mm -hmm. how, how as a as a minister of the gospel how do you deal with that yeah so I mean that's that's a, a multifaceted question uh, uh, first I would say anybody who tampers with scripture should be condemned for tampering with scripture because mm -hmm. it's God's word we have no right to add or take away mm -hmm. right uh, secondly when we talk about tampering with scripture we we need to kind of clarify what we mean by tampering with scripture. So some people will ask the question, uh, how do how do we know the Bible we received today has it been changed or altered and that we can trust that, you know, the sixty six yeah. books are really you know. Um, well that's the job of what are, who are called people who are called text critics and that's an area I'm really interested in doing PhD work in. Um, my focus has been on the New Testament, but um, if anybody wanted to change in, in the, the Bible um, and in instances where we have seen changes, we have such a multiplicity of manuscripts, right? Um, that if, if somebody had changed something in one manuscript, we can look at the hundred manuscripts over here and we don't see the change, right? Or if something is inserted into the Bible, um, you can look at all the manuscripts that predate those manuscripts and that insertion is not there, right? There's something called the tenacity of the text. And it's when something is added into the manuscript tradition, all the manuscripts after that typically contain those verses, but you can see in the manuscripts before that, they don't contain those verses. And so you can clearly see, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, most changes that have been made to the Bible were accidental, right? Um, you know, scribes weren't getting the Bible and be like, I'm going to add this here and take this because I don't like it, right? Um, and sometimes we would see, 
uh, scribal mistakes, and they would see two readings for a verse, and so they would just put both readings in there. And so, you know, we see an expansion of the text a bit. But but we have so many manuscripts, especially the New Testament. The number is almost 5,900 now. Um, and the two earliest Bibles we have are Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus. So it's not the King James? <laughs> it's not the 1611 King James. <laughs> no. Um, and these are incredible testimonies. And, and the verses that are in dispute, here's the interesting thing. Any verses um, that are in dispute by textual critics change no doctrine of the Christian church. I mean. They're small things. Uh, and, a, and when you hear people talk about all the variants, all the differences between the, the manuscripts, right? Some of them can't even be translated into English. Like, for instance, John is often written with two N's in Greek. Ioannes or one N. And that, does, that doesn't even translate to English. And then you've got thousands of variants like that, right? Um, so when, when we talk about tampering with the Bible, the first thing I want to say is the Bible that we have today has been transmitted accurately through history. We can trust it, right? And any, any verses that are in dispute are minor. And um, the, the major ones, there's really two major ones I would say. There's the longer ending of Mark, and there's what's called the pericope adulterae. And the per- pericope adulterae is when, um, when Jesus, you know, is with the, um, the prostitute, and it says he who, you know, has not is without sin cast the first stone we see that up here in different places in the new testament um so i don't i don't think it's original does that change any doctrine of the christian church yeah, no exactly does, does the longer ending of mark change any doctrine of the christian church no and text if you read when you're reading your bible if you look in the footnotes it'll say the earliest manuscripts mss do not contain these verses right um so so we can trust the bible now when you see people abusing the Bible, that's that's a whole different issue, right? So they're taking something that's been transmitted accurately, but they're they're changing it and altering it, they, you know. And, and you see people from every cult, ism, whatever, tampering with the Bible, trying to alter it, treating it like Plato, and not. So when when you when Pastor Ryan and our our, our Pastor Al preach, we want to do what's called exegesis, right? We want to understand what the author intended to communicate to Amen. his audience. Right, not what I wanted to say, not what makes Joel feel good, but what was Paul trying to communicate to the Church of Rome, for instance, and how would the recipients of his letter have understood that? And the, 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 the guiltiest place we see this is in, in Revelation. People re, read all sorts of stuff in Revelation. You know, oh, the, the mark of the beast is a chip we're going to get in our arm, or what, whatever. Like the, the recipients of the Book of Revelation wouldn't have understood it that way at all, right? And so, uh, these yeah. are these are documents yeah. that we're. We're trying to um, interpret faithfully in an historical context. It's called grammatical historical um, interpretation. You, you want to understand the grammar of the text. You want to understand its context. And so whenever you see abuse of that, um, like the Jefferson Bible, where he took about all the miracles of Jesus because he, you know, he was a deist and he didn't believe in Jesus. And so he just took out the stuff he didn't like. You can, uh, it's very clear when somebody's perverting the Bible. Yeah. And we should wholeheartedly condemn that. Um, without any uncertain terms. And so, you know, um, any specifics that come to mind, we can discuss. But that would be my general answer. Does that help? Yeah, it it does. It does. Uh, So to sum it up, I I guess I'm going to let you answer it, but I I know the answer. But is Christianity a white man religion? Was it (laughs) created by the white man? Um, (laughs) You know, was it it birthed from... Europe and, and used to to keep us emotionally and mentally enslaved. Yeah. Uh, well, the the short answer obviously is no. Of course not. Jesus was not white, and he wasn't black. He was a Palestinian Jew. I, I think a lot of us, unfortunately, would look at Jesus and think he was like a terrorist or something, right? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, and you know these these. So was, so hold on. Sorry. Jesus wasn't black. No. I mean, we can't know for sure, right? Because we don't have nobody had a camera back then. But he was he he, he was Middle Eastern looking. So he wasn't white. He also wasn't white. So no. the, the white Jesus with the blue eyes and the, uh, so basically yeah. Jesus looked like the, the dude down there that owned the little Yang Yang store on the corner down. Uh, on the what? On the corner down. <laughs> I know I'm country man. <laughs> Sorry, I. <laughs> well, I Actually, the you know, I want to. I'm going to pull up. Let me pull up a picture of what scholars think Jesus probably looked like. The other okay. interesting thing 
is that Jesus was a carpenter, so he probably had short hair. The hair wouldn't get in his way of his carpentry, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So, like, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, whether Jesus is like some pasty white guy with, you know, blue eyes and a robe in your pictures, or Jesus has an afro in your pictures, it's probably, both of them are probably wrong. Let me, let me pull up uh, Jesus' image according to scholars. But, uh, you know, again, we. We just really, we don't know, but we, well, actually, we know where he's you, from. You, you know, these arguments when it comes to the church, it really is, is, is meaningless. They are. Because, they're, you know, the Bible says in Christ, there's no Jew, there's no, no Gentile, Gentile exactly. there's no male, no female. And that's so, what I want us to focus as, on. As believers of the faith, that's what we need to focus on. But we do understand that, that, that you know, the Bible does say, you know, our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of stronghold, casting down every imagination and everything that exalts itself against what? The knowledge of Christ. We understand that biblically, uh, Peter said, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So in that context, spiritual warfare is not getting in a room and, and yelling at invisible things that's flying around. Spiritual warfare is getting in the word and allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal through you to you then through you um, the spiritual warfare is pulling down those strongholds that 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 deals with our mind and our imagination to try to get us to believe differently than what we're instructed to believe and as believers I believe that we deal with this spiritual warfare every day for us to deny the authenticity of scripture maybe not denying Christ but to deny the basic instructions that tell you don't do <laughs> but you do anyway, you know, those are strongholds. Those are things, uh, 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 Adam, even Adam and Eve dealt with it in the beginning. You know, and, well, God didn't mean that. That ain't, yeah, that's, that's, that's those messengers from Satan. So, you know, as believers, you know, we, we're, we're one in Christ. That's my brother. That's probably how you look. Pro probably. This is a scholar's recreation. Of course, we don't know, but... Well, know. that kind of would make sense because of the nature of God. Jesus was a humble man. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the Pharisees couldn't, and scribes couldn't receive him because they felt that Jesus came to reestablish the kingdom of David. And in and, and an earthly kingdom, when, when Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God, on earth. They thought it was to reestablish the, the kingdom that, that David had the powerful, mighty, you mm -hmm. know, uh, yeah. uh, Jerusalem kingdom and they was going to overthrow Rome yeah. and all that. So when he came in riding on a goat, that's not, no, you know, but he was humble, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, the guy with the long hair and I don't even think they had the stuff to press it. They had like yeah. that back then, yeah, you right. know. Jesus and, had great hair, apparently. Yeah, yeah. You, you know. So I mean, I could, yeah. I could take that figure. And and yeah. you know, it's it's that's not to say Jesus isn't going to come back one day in judgment. You know, riding on a white horse, like it says in Revelation, with a robe dipped in blood to judge. Um, he will come back as that warrior king one day. But that's not. He came to save his people first, yeah. and and those who don't turn to him, you know, like it says in John, have already been condemned for not turning to him. Um, but yeah, going back to what you said, the, the real heart of this issue is that it doesn't matter what color Jesus was, right? Um, you know, it's, it's like Paul says in Galatians, there's no man or woman, no Jew, nor Gentile, nor slave, nor free, nor Scythian, or barbarian. All are one in Christ, in Christ right? Yeah. Jesus' level of melanin in his skin is relevant. The, the, the claim that if Jesus was white or if the early Christians were white, um, that's a problem is racist just like if I was to say oh Jesus was black and the early Christians were black so I don't want to follow Jesus that would also be racist the the color of Jesus skin is irrelevant and and the beauty of Christianity is every time you know those kinds of issues come up they're undermined by the Bible and what's elevated is our unity in Christ and that's the important thing um, and so that's you know um, a, what we see in a lot of America today is people talking about the white church, the black church. Those aren't biblical categories. There's just the church, and it's supposed to be been unified in Christ. And in Revelation 5:9, it says He ransomed people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Amen. So um, mm -hmm. there's there's a heart when people start making those objections. There's a, there's a heart issue underlying the the objection, and it's I don't like the idea if early Christians were white or I don't like the idea of early Christians were black or tan skinned or, or, or whatever you know what I mean so um, 
Yeah, and, and Christianity and the, the message that we're all made in the image of God is the milieu in which slavery was able to be abolished. You know, people did misuse the Bible, but the real me- the people who misused the Bible were not standing on the message of the Bible. They were Come taking on. stuff out of context. But what, what, what allowed and, and created this were, were these ideas that we have inalienable rights, that they're entitled all people um, who are made in the image of God, which is everybody, right? So um, that's, that's what I said. Well, you know, it's a shame that we, we have to do this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But, but, you know, I mean, I, 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 I wish, you know, people would just, we could just quote the scripture. Yeah. We're all one in mm-hmm. Christ, and everybody just yields to that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, um, we're going to do a Q&A in one second. Uh, right, if you have any questions, write them down so you don't forget them. And, and uh, Evangelist Barber, you'll be our first one. But, but, uh, okay. All right. Write, write your question down. Be, be the first one. So t- to sum this up, because we do want to save some time for Q&A, um, Christianity is not the white man's religion. You've given proven facts about the Council of Nicaea. This last question. Do you want me to talk about Athanasius real quick? Yeah. Oh, yeah. How you know I was born? Uh, oh, yeah. I yeah. didn't know you were. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah so if, I'll, I'll, whenever I hear people try to misuse the Council of Nicaea as it relates to race, I find absolutely hilarious because um, so uh, one of the prominent people at the Council of Nicaea yeah. was Alexander of Alexandria. He was the Bishop of Alexandria, and the yeah. person who was under him was named Athanasius. Yeah. And after the Council of Nicaea, what had happened, um, even though they came out with the Nicene Creed, there was what was called the Arian Ascendancy. Okay, so remember, Arius denied the divinity of Jesus. And all these people started following Arius after the Council of Nicaea. And the greatest defender of Nicene yeah. biblical Christianity was Athanasius of Alexandria. Um, what did his opponents call him? The Black Dwarf. Yeah. Because he was from Northern Africa and African. And he was the greatest defender. I mean, he's he's one of my absolute heroes. Um, I love Athanasius. And I guess he was short. And clearly he was African because he was from Northern Africa, uh, the Egypt area. So to, to say that the Council of Nicaea was run by pure white, uh, just white men, is pure fantasy. Um, yeah, it's... It's, it's, it's egregious historiography. But the, the, the thing that I find often when I'm talking to people about this, like, like, have you ever read the Council of Nicaea? Have you read the Nicene Creed? Do you know when it happened? No, they're just parroting what they heard from somebody who heard from somebody else who heard from somebody else. And you don't find, I mean, go read serious historians. J. N. D. Kelly or Jaroslav Pelikan or um, Schaff wrote this tremendous, that's in Lagos, this tremendous like six, seven volume work of church mm. history. Um, these, the, the issues of race and ethnicity, these were not issues that they were um, discussing. The, the only real um, discussion we have of these things is to somebody in the Council of Jerusalem, and, and, and if you're reading Paul's letter to the Church of Galatia, does somebody have to be circumcised and become a Jew before they can be a Christian? That was really the only um, ethnic issue that the early church faced. Um, so all of this, you know, all these arguments that people are just unloading onto Nicaea. There are people who obviously have no idea what Nicaea was about. And it's an, it's an abuse of history and frankly disrespectful to the people who risked their lives and were martyred and persecuted for true Christianity. It's a front to them and it's, it's frankly it's disgusting. So, you know, everybody in here, even if you was an individual, even if you're watching and you're an individual, say, I don't, I don't have a problem with that, that's not my issue. Uh, you, this is stuff you still want to know because you're going to run into people who, who really believes that Christianity is the white man's religion, who really believes that, you know, we, we in, in our African heritage, you know, we got to go back to our roots. And our roots is not Christianity. Well, how do you know that? If, if the black dwarf, write that down, Google that, you know, he, he, was, he, he was an African. And he was one of the greatest defenders of the faith. So, you know, before, you know, we were enslaved as a people, we had people in Africa that were believers and they was prominent in the faith. So, you know, it's simple things that can debunk a lot of stuff. 
but we just have to study it and we have to ask questions. So if you're not an individual that's dealing with those type of, you know, things, then you still need to know it because we're called as believers to be defenders of the faith. We got to defend this faith. We're living in a time to where my generation and the younger is, is not coming in this building. And it's because of all the false falsalities that, that has been presented to them and people in the church can't answer those questions. You, you know, how, how can you be in church 20 or 30 years and you can't answer simple questions that I'm having that's, that's literally drawing me away? You know, we, we got to get away from the, 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 the mysticism and the, 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 the things that we do in our church services and we really got to get to the meat of the gospel. Um, the, 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 when you read the New Testament, Paul was, was writing to challenge doctrines and beliefs and things that was coming against Jesus Christ. Peter, the same thing, encouraging a persecuted church, people that was going through, you know, for someone they've never seen. You see what I'm saying? And we got to be able to defend that and not just say, hey, just believe. You know, you know, just have faith. Well, that ain't working anymore. You know, and this is why we're doing this. This is why we're you know, eluding our time and our resources to to connect with one another and build one another and through through the persecution, through the things that the Satan, you know, presents to us because we understand that these are some perilous times we're living in. If the church don't really operate as God's ecclesia for real and defend the faith, we might not have a church in 30 years. It's that serious. And it's time out for playing games and, and coming into our facilities and buildings and, and doing rituals that we think that brings us power while neglecting the word of God. You know what I mean? We got to defend this faith. So, so I'm saying all that if you're not one that has a problem with it, still study it. Because you may can save somebody's, God can use you to save somebody's spirit. Amen. Amen. Um, um, we're going to open up the floor for Q&A. Those that may be watching online, just type your questions in the comment box. Um, we're going to be doing this. This is something that, you know, God put on my heart as, the, as a visionary here and um, yielding to the, the gifts that God has sent here. Um, this is, this is what we're going to do, equipping, you know, followers and, and birthing them into leaders here. And it's, it's all about teaching. No question is a dumb question. Um, we're going to answer them. If you're not a believer, if you're a Hebrew Israelite, we're ready. We equipped. Come with it. We got you. So we're going to open up the flow for Q and A. Uh, Courtney, you who was first? You had a question. Go ahead. Do we have an extra mic that she can? That anybody I have? Uh, okay. Well, the people on the camera might want to hear. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Your, your question. I have a question. We can repeat um, the question. Yeah, okay, we'll repeat it. Yeah, go ahead. If certain things in the, about Christ, we're going to go back to the blue-eyed, long-haired Jesus. Mm -hmm. if, if it wasn't important, why would it, why would it change? Why would his image change if it wasn't important? Well, I mean, I... To me, I feel like my personal opinion... Um, if there's no problem, why change? Well, we, we got something called uh, the whitewashing of Christianity as well. And it goes back to what Joel was saying. Is you, you, you have, you, 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 I mean, that's, that's anything. You can take, if, if, I, if I write a book and, and that book is meant to show you how to build a house and someone takes that book and they teach that book and, and, and they use that book to teach people how to build a house that would kill people, does that make me an evil person? That makes the one who took the book to use it to destroy someone else. You see what I'm saying? So we have historically the whitewashing of Christianity and people have used it to, to elude a culture above another culture in order to empower that culture. So to, to, I can't, I, I mean, you know, to, to say that it was significant and important, it wasn't important to me. 
you know, it was important to whoever did that and whoever created that to make that image a prominent image to, to be able to say that, hey, God looks like this. You see what I'm saying? And we even got that in the black church. And that is a, 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 another part of the question was basically me saying, if you take one thing, what makes me, why, why should I believe everything else that they made? You took out one thing, how much do you take out something else? Well, well, it goes back to what Joel said. We, we must study and we must trace back the manuscripts. And, and what Joel meant by manual, manuscripts, the Bible can be traced back to his original manuscript. And there's over, what, what 1,500 you said? Uh, well, for the New Testament, we have almost, last time I checked the number, it was 5,800 and something close to 5,900. For the New Testament in Greek, the original language was written in. If you look at the Latin and you add, you know, uh, Gregorian, Gregorian, Georgian, I'm sorry, Georgian and um, like Syriac, I mean, the number swells up to 15, 20,000. Same thing, um, we have thousands of, of uh, manuscripts of the Hebrew Old Testament, and there was a group called the Masoretes who. Um, we have what's called a Masoretic text in the way that they copied manuscripts whenever they would write the word Yahweh, the name of God, the Tetragrammaton they would wash their hands and then after they finished the manuscript they would count how many lines and how many words and if they didn't match up they would throw away the new manuscript they had just written. So they took incredible care to preserve the, the Old Testament. So there is an original text? So, so the, the, when you have an original document it's called the autograph, right? And we don't have any of the autographs. But that's not a bad thing, actually. So when Paul wrote to, let's say, when he wrote to Rome, the book of Romans, his epistle to Rome, right, if um, that was dispersed and copied all over, right? But if somebody had the original, what, what could they do? They could change the original, right? But since if I wrote something and everybody in this room right now copied, if I wrote a page and everybody copied it, and I went and tried to change the original, you could all look at all the different copies and you could figure out what I had originally written and then if we didn't have the original nobody could change it and now we have the testimony and all the copies so I believe God has preserved his word perfectly in the manuscript yeah. tradition of the Old and New Testament and, and biblically to line up sorry to cut you no, off Joe, Joe but he said out the word of, out the mouth of two or three witnesses my word shall be established you see what I'm saying so there's not one God didn't, didn't design this for one single individual you know, to, to be able to, to say what's true and what's not. Everything, every person that Jesus appeared to after the, the resurrection, every, everything that has happened in history after the canon of scripture was finished to preserve. See, we have to look at the supernatural operation of God and the church. Nothing happened that's of God was a mistake. So by us not having the original text, that's the plan of God. It's his strategic way of preserving his word. And, and that's where faith has to come in as well. Because you do have a lot of scholars that's not believers. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you have a lot of, there's the written word and there's also the living word. And the written word only points you to the living word, which is Christ. And his spirit lives in us. So, so I, I, I really believe that God had... You know, there, there are men and women of God outside of Scripture that God still dealt with, just like he deal with us now, that, that he gave strategic ways of preserving his word. And you got all these manuscripts. There's no way that, that, that somebody can take the word of God and alter it and stand and say it's true and it can't be debunked. It's just that we don't have the information. Now, the Bible says that our people perish for a lack of knowledge. Knowledge of what? Who? Jesus Christ, God, the kingdom of God. And, 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 and now we're, we're entering into a time where God, and especially in the city of Mobile, God is putting a burden on men and women in the faith that's saying, hey, we got to get back to this gospel. We got to get back to this word. We have to, and, 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 and I love your question. We also don't ask questions. You know, we, we'll go off, you know, there'll be, there'll, there'll be doubt, there, there, there will be doubt in our heart. And instead of, you know, presenting that openly, openly, we'll keep it in our heart and it will hinder our faith subconsciously. So that's why I tell people, man, write questions, write questions, ask questions, write them down, put them in the box. 
these things so they can be answered because once your questions are answered and once you, it's only going to increase your faith. You know, I know Carol Amanda don't mind me testifying this where she had a question about slavery in the Bible and it was vexing her. Well, as a shepherd, I took the time out. I think we spent, what, an hour and a half back down in, in the study going through scriptures and exegeting the scripture and, and showing her what the word slavery really meant. You know, it wasn't slavery like 400 years ago. People voluntarily gave themselves over to survive and things of that nature. And answering those questions actually edified her and built her. So she came in, buried, she left out rejoicing. Right. And those are the type of miracles and those are the type of supernatural events that I believe that God want to see in this day and time. So what's your question answer? If, 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 if it was not, we, we can, can I touch on. Yes, sir. A few things. Yeah. So um, w uh, something else I wanted to add to the whole thing, like, let's say I, I wrote something down. Right. And we don't have the original, but everybody in this room copied it. Now, let's say, you know, um, Sister Barbo wanted to get back at me. And one of the things I wrote is, Joel is teaching truth tonight. And Sister Barbara changed it to, Joel is not teaching truth tonight, right? But everybody else in this room made a copy. And so we can look at everybody else's copy and see it was changed right there, right? And that's the situation we have with the Old and New Testament. If we see a change or an addition or an, a subtraction, scribes typically didn't tend to delete stuff. They typically tended to add things, right? Because they didn't want to lose anything from the Word of God, right? And so we can look at all the other manuscript copies and compare and say, ah, this was added or this was subtracted. Um, and one of the interesting things uh, when you do text criticism and you compare manuscripts, I mean, you got to keep in mind when the New Testament was being transmitted in its early years, these were people who were persecuted. You can look at some manuscripts and you can see how people actually copied. So if you copied the sentence, Joel is teaching truth, you would just look, Joel is teaching truth, and you'd write that down, right? But there were people who, would, who couldn't even read Greek, and they would look at a letter and copy the letter, then the next letter, and the, the errors they make is swapping two letters because they couldn't read the word. So these were people under duress and, and doing everything they can to preserve the word of God, right? There was no conspiracy to, like, try to change it, right? Um, the other thing, going back to um, the, the whitewashing issue, uh, of, of course there has been some of that, but a lot of people don't realize it's like when they read the Bible, they often picture it in their own context, right? So if you look at medieval Europe, and you look at paintings of like King David, you'll see him like on a horse in knight's armor and stuff like that. And it's because they just imagine, oh, things have always been this way. So this is what these people yeah, must have been like. Reality. Yeah, that was their reality. During the time of Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, another one of my heroes, um, when he was alive, on average, I, th I think the statistic, statistic is people didn't travel from beyond 20 miles from where they were born in their entire life, right? So their world was often very small, and that's all they knew. So the only, if, if the only person you ever knew was black or white or whatever, and then you read about Jesus, you just naturally picture him as white or black or wherever you come from because you, your, your world, your horizon is, is so small. And that's not necessarily their fault. That was just the reality they, they lived in. Um, and they just they did they may not have known that you know Africa existed, for instance, or people in Africa might not know like the Scandinavian countries you know Norway, Sweden, Finland existed, stuff like that. so you know we need to when we look at history, we have to be fair and realize these are people situated in their own reality in their own context, and it's not always you know they're not always doing something maliciously it's just that's just the world they knew. You know what I mean? And, and, and I'm going to add to that. You, you, they didn't have the internet like we did. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so they couldn't just Google something. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, they didn't even have pens. But what did they use? Like quills. Yeah, and the, yeah, yeah. They would write on what's the, yeah, yeah, but, the scrolls, but, papyri, and vellum, which are animal skins. Yeah, but awesome question. And, yeah, and, and if... Question. if 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 there's more things you 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 know need to ask and you know please please anybody in here you know we you know uh, Pastor Joe has has definitely been a blessing to us with with books. <laughs> Thank you, brother. <laughs> so we got a whole lot. Have to do that laughing because we was back. To, I said, man, it's another box. We was putting the books on the shelf. So it's plenty of literature. Uh, 
Logos, I, man, I, that that program has changed my life as a as a believer, as a pastor, and and it's L O G O S yeah. dot com. Go there. It's a faith. It's a product of faith life, and um, you, you can get the free version, and you got some books, but there are also paid version. Logos eight, I think they came out with nine, now, right? I think they just came out with the new, like, nine or eight, whatever. Yeah, what, so, there's a new one. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, I think I got the silver edition, and man, I got thousands of books in the digital library, you know, and you can put in topics and things like that, and it will give you all those resources that you can take and go read. It just take a lot of work. You know, it, it takes some diligence and consistency. You know, we, we, we can't continue. There's a lot of growing I got to do uh, in that, but I can't say there's a lot of growth that has taken, taken place because of a lot of diligence and due diligence that, that, that I've done personally to, to rectify a lot of questions that I have had, not necessarily to, to de 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 demote the, the, the faith of Christianity, but just a lot of questions I've had that's dealing with the church and how it operates and things that we do now. And we're going to deal with some of them things um, in these sessions. We're, we're going to deal with, with uh, an example, you know, is there power in the altar? <laughs> you, know, um, you know, it's just a lot of things that we do that's irrelevant as it compares to the power of God and his word. You know what I mean? Uh, so I, I would just, I, I would recommend anybody, man. I, I really want these sessions to be something that's going to empower us to go study and go research. You know, even if we're not dealing with, 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 with our faith in Jesus Christ, because I'm solid, amen? <laughs> but we still need to study, mm -hmm. amen? Um, you know, for father equipping, but uh, do we do we have any more questions? Yeah, please feel free. Is anybody watching live? We got any questions on live? Okay, go, go ahead, Caramel. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm gonna ask you about, uh, man, this is a good session. I really, it's informative to me, but I think. <clears throat> like to piggyback off of, off of what you were saying, like I agree with everything that y'all said. Like to to present the concept of race back in the biblical times, like they were really really sidelining us because they didn't see. Um, and like for me, I personally know that racism made a social construct. I mm -hmm. don't believe that in like what you were saying. Like you know, there is neither Jew nor Greek. You know, so. This race that he's made up, but I think black people are bitter. And the reason why I'm asking this question is because I have like a lot of hotels and you know, black people, Israelites who hit me up. And we have these discussions and it's really hard for me to answer it because there's a part of me that kind of agrees and you know is confused with it. But should like white evangelicals like take accountability for the way black people see religion? Like, for example, um, number one, we all have to be accountable, including black people. Um, but, like, you have, like, one day we was talking about George Whitefield, who did altar calls, and in those altar calls, he sold slaves. And today we practice altar calls. You see what I'm saying? So, like, is there a certain level of accountability? Because when you have people like, you know, Trump and white supremacists who claim Christianity, and you know it makes it really hard for black people in America to like really, I guess, want to subscribe to it. You know what I'm saying? And then like, so then how do you how do you answer that? You know, like how can we move forward as a, a union? You know, both white and black. Well, well, I think the gospel, the 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 the, the real gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, itself will, will birth let me put it this way as a believer then I let Pastor Joe but from my perspective of that as a believer my accountability is to preach the gospel and the gospel will 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 do what it's been intended to do 
the word of God. He said, my word will not return back unto me void, but it will, it will accomplish everything that it's been sent to do. Uh, even one, one very great thing that, that one of my brothers, Jeremy, Pastor Jeremy Thrash, taught me um, once. He said, it's not our job to convict. Right. It's our job to preach the word of God and the Holy Spirit will convict. Um, I, I don't. Joel is, is Caucasian, correct? I think you, you so. Think so. OK, <laughs> so I've been told. So when I look at Joel, I, I don't look at, man, your great, great, great grandfather, you know, put my great, great, grandfather in mm -hmm. bondage. I don't. I don't look for him to be accountable for that. I look for him to preach and teach the truth. And that truth, he's, that's what he's accountable to do. So to answer your question, if, you know, Pastor Joe is in a situation to where we have a culture of people that's being, whether systematically or whether physically, in bondage, he must preach the truth, period, and say what does say the Lord. That's what prophetic voices do. That word that he preached that is truth is going to come and condemn that oppression. You see what I'm saying? Vice versa. If it was uh, white people getting abused, I'm, my responsibility as a prophetic voice is to preach the truth, which is going to agree with God that that's wrong. You see what I'm saying? And, 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 and so it, it goes back to if people are not preaching the gospel, they're in error. No matter what color, no matter what what. And that preaching of the gospel, it, it doesn't change through culture. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't change with race. It doesn't change with economic status. It remains the same. And it doesn't matter what time we're living in or what dispensation, the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't change and it lifts a standard. I tell people all the time, it don't matter if I'm failing in an area in life, that word is not going to change. That word is going to be true and remain the same. So the accountability that I believe from white evangelicals is they're accountable to tell the truth. And that truth is going to condemn what should be condemned. That makes sense. So, so, for example, if I walk in the church and I see in, and I'm seeing people being treated unfair here, it's my responsibility as a prophetic voice to say that's wrong. But I can't just leave it there. I must go to the word. Amen. I must go to the word. Now, what what I believe in, correct me if I'm wrong, is is what you're saying is we're seeing today that we're not seeing people stand up. Yeah, for lack of better words, I, I didn't word it right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that people we're not seeing people stand up of other races. Let's just not say white, other races for black oppression, systematic racism, redlining, all of this stuff. Well, I those people can't be preaching the gospel. See what I'm saying? They can't. They they, they can't because the gospel is going to go against all of that. Because we're one in Christ, right? We're one in faith. So whether Brother Joe see me being persecuted, it's his responsibility to stand up, not just because he's white and I'm black, because he's my brother, vice versa to him. If I see him being attacked by his own kind, you see what I'm saying? Hey, hold on. That's wrong right there. You know what I'm saying? Whether it's my people, his people, it doesn't matter. When we stand, we stand as ambassadors of Jesus Christ representing the kingdom of God, which supersedes every culture, every religion, every mountain, every city. When we stand speaking on his behalf, there's an authority that comes with that, that, that precedes racism because that's demonic. And anything the devil got something to do with, I come to tear that kingdom down. You understand? And Pastor Joel should be the same way. And, and, and the Mexican pastor and the Chinese pastor, because when we all come together with a church and we're coming to edify the body and to show the world that Satan is alive.
You see what I'm saying? So to answer your question, I do agree with you with that. But my agreement comes from what are they preaching? What are they teaching? Is it a, a religion? Is it a, 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 a denomination? Is it a cult? Or is it the gospel of Jesus Christ being presented through the earth through his ecclesia? You see what I'm saying? So my belief, if we're teaching the truth, we're going to agree. Absolutely. And, and I know we different colors. Yeah, we yeah. are indeed. <laughs> but, when they come in his face, like when, when people approach me and they ask me about that, it is safe to be like, hey, they, they really do not brothers and sisters in the faith. If, they, if what they're preaching doesn't align with the word of God and it's contradictory. Okay, let's go deeper. Like, people are preaching false gospels every day, all day. You know what I mean? Because if I have the Holy Spirit in me, man, and I see somebody getting treated unjustly and unfairly, I got to do something. I can't just sit there and watch that. There was a young man that came up here to this church and, 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 and took a girl's money that had worked hard all day for it. We went and found him and got that money back. We the church. Like, God didn't raise no pawns. <laughs> when you look in the Bible, the men of God was not timid. I'm just being honest. They, they, was, they, they got down for this. And, and, and when I read the scripture, that's what I see. That's why I go hard. I ain't, you ain't say what you want to say. I'm going to die for this. You understand? I'm a little, I may be a little more aggressive with it than other people, but that's just me. So if I pull up and Pastor Joel is in here and I walk in here and people, you know what I'm saying, eyeing him and, and, and persecute, I'm going to stand up and say something. And I'm quite sure if the shoe was on the other foot, if, mm -hmm. if, 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 if I go into an, 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 a, a, a mostly white congregation and they're treating me unfair, I expect Pastor Joel to stand up and say something. Why? Because he's a preacher of what? the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we're yielding to that, there's a standard. Even if that standard can't be reached all the time, <laughs> grace is there for that, but that standard don't change. You know what I'm saying? If I'm wrong, man, I'm wrong. Look, how can you tell me and you wrong? Because I ain't telling you Jesus is through me. This ain't my word. It heals. And it ain't nothing to play with. You see what I'm saying? See, it's when we put, we get in the mix with ourselves, my word, my sermon, my church, my people, my, my. So when you get that my in effect, what happens is everybody that's following your mind, it becomes cultive. So now that's where racism comes in. Because when I'm preaching the gospel, I look at my brother, man. Absolutely. I, that's my brother. Amen. When I first Amen. met him, that's my brother. I didn't think about oppression yeah. of my, I didn't think about that. I thought about this, my brother, and God sent him here for a reason, and I honor that. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And that's where the church got to get you, white evangelicals, black evangelicals. Mm -hmm. Amen? Because it's just as many black races as there is white races. And I said once and said again, we as a people, we got to stop being so racist mm -hmm. and stop looking at he's white. Look how he talk, different culture. Okay. Maybe I can learn something from my brother. So I'm here to receive. If he showed up with Christ in his heart, I got to yield, man. Mm -hmm. Amen. And that's the gospel, man. Mm -hmm. In Christ, there's no male, no female. In Christ, there's no black, no white. In Christ, there's no one better you know, because we all ratchet mm -hmm. in Christ. Give your scripture. Our righteousness is a so filthy rags to him. That's why he tells us to seek his kingdom and his right. Don't make me preach up in here. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So it, we as a culture have to get out of that chest like they culture have to get out of that. Amen. Because we can be just as judgmental and, and, and just as, I, and I'm not saying that what happened 400 years ago, it's not relevant. It is. It's a shame. It's, it's messed up. I wish it wouldn't have happened because of the gospel. It was unfair, right? But I'm not finna sit my faith on people that's not standing up. I'm, I, I got the power to stand up myself. Because get what? When I stand up in that gospel, I don't need nobody else to stand up for me. No other coach. I don't need no white evangelicals that ain't saying that this ain't fair. I can say it's not fair neither. 
And if I stand up and step out in that, God may send somebody <laughs> of a different race to stand with me. See that? Because we walk in power and authority. We're kingdom city. I don't need nobody to stand up for me. <laughs> somebody break in your house, you're going to go call the white evangelical, talking about something, you're going to come. Now nah, you're going to get your pistol. You're going to do what you got to do to protect your child, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm serious right here. You know what I'm saying? So we can't continue to dwell on that. That's what I'm saying. We can't continue to allow these things to be distractions because while we're being distracted, our children are walking away from the faith. When we're called to be unified. Amen. We, we, I don't yield to this government, man. My government ain't from here. And in, in the government I come from, none of that matter. Amen. Because my dad ain't got no car. You can't even see him in the natural. And that's my dad. He's Abba. <laughs> Amen. I say it once, I say it again. I, I say it, I, 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 I'm proud and I say it loud. <laughs> you got anything to add to that? Yeah, just just one small thing. I, I want to provide a, a a winsome word of caution. Um, I heard you mention George Whitfield. Uh, the the thing we have to remember when we're looking through Christian history is there's there's only one person that was sinless, right? Um, I I hate I, I hate that 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 was a reality with George Whitfield because he preached the gospel to so many people. One of my, one of my greatest heroes, Martin Luther, sparked off the Protestant Reformation. Um, I gave Pastor Ryan a gift the other day and it had a, two of the solas from the Reformation yeah. on it. And those were the sola fide, yeah. faith alone and Christ alone, right? Um, if, if we set our standards so high that we can only listen to people who don't sin, I mean, Pastor Ryan and I shouldn't be up here then, right? So. Just, just realize when you're looking through church history at different people, um, you can, you can take the wisdom that God has given them and discard the rest, right? Um, because I mean, even Saint Augustine had had issues with lust. Um, I mean, uh, if if we threw out everybody in church history who, who had sin issues, then we throw out all of church history. Um, the Bible too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. So. I don't want to say that in any way to try to justify that. Of course, that was a heinous, awful sin. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I've read a sermon by George Whitfield where he defended the doctrine of grace more beautifully than just about anybody. So, you know, it hurts that he did that. And I've hurt people in my life by my own sins, right? And I'm sure it's hard for them to listen to me sometimes. But um, that's where grace comes in, right? Um, so just, you know, tr I know it's hard, and we, we, and we have to be so delicate when we handle these issues because you don't ever want to sound like you're trying to justify sin, yeah. right? right? Like, like I said, Martin Luther, towards the end of his life, he, he became very anti-Semitic. He wrote horrible things about the Jews. And, but, but at the same time, God used him to, to restore the yeah, gospel sure all, all over Europe. And so, sure you know... We just have to remember that we're, we're all sinners. We don't want to excuse the sin, but we also want to look at the the wisdom or the teaching or the, the blessings God still chooses to pour out through sinners, right? So, um, yeah, just, I just I want us to have that kind of attitude when we're trying to um, look at, at the great men and women of God of history and when they weren't so great. We have to acknowledge that, but, you know. Um, we also need to see how God uses people, and yeah, I mean that, that it sucks about George Whitfield. You know, um, he was used in the, in the Great Awakening. He preached the gospel to so many people, but um, at the same time, I'm, I'm not um, unaware of the fact that I'm sitting in a room with African Americans, and he he dealt in slavery, right? So. Um, you know, we we need to take the good and throw out the bad, right? And acknowledge the bad. We don't want to cover it up. You know, that that's even worse. I and mean, we don't want to justify it. But, you know, um, I'm sure Athanasius had his issues too, um, other than being short. <laughs> so, I'm just kidding. I got that issue. <laughs> so. <laughs> but, but, you know, we, we don't want it to become a catalyst to, to cause us to be divided in our hearts either mm -hmm. by the actions of someone else. 
You know, we, we want to look at that's a reality, and we, we got to deal with that. And we also have to deal with the, 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 the falsehoods that, that, that were birthed through that, like ultra calls and things of that nature. But we, we're not going to allow that to, to exceed the gospel. And that's what I was saying before. It's about the gospel. If the gospel is being preached, it's going to condemn what it should condemn. It's going to edify what it should edify. It, it's it's going to do the word. You know what I mean? So whether it's, it, they're black, they're white, because I love Pastor Joe, but if he start preaching another gospel, I think, bruh, we need to talk. <laughs> and if he don't repent, bruh, can't rock with you no more, man. It ain't got nothing about doing being white. Because Joe, shout out, y'all need to spend some time with him. He fits in. Trust me. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, you will, you will enjoy Joe's company. You know, and, and I thank you, Holy Spirit. I think we need to do that more. You know what I mean? I think we need to spend time with each other and other people and, and, and get into their world because I'm quite sure when, they, when Pastor Joe first came in here, he was so amazed. He said, man, I just love it here. Man, they just, yo, you guys just welcome me on with open arms. You know, he was up here, oh, y'all got me stirred up because people say amen. I'm like, dude. <laughs> okay, you know, it, that's what we do, you know, and that's what I love about this ministry. You know, we didn't, what is this white guy from talking about? Oh, Lord. No. Everybody looked at him as their brother. As, well, did I say that right? Everybody looked at him as their brother. Yeah. Looked at him as their brother. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. We followed. Everybody yeah. looked at him as their brother, and that's how it should be. And I think we need to spend time, and that goes from black to white, white to black. You know, I think we'll begin to see, because I have a business partner, and he was raised a little different than me. And you would think he's racist, but he's not. He's been such a blessing to my company and me in ways that amazes me. And in it came at a time when God was really teaching me the kingdom of God. And I'm not going to lie, I had a little racial issues in my heart. And I think God used this man to change my view of life and really look at myself and examine myself because of the culture he was raised in. It's different than me. I was raised in Tomanville, the ugly part, you know. He was raised up there, you know. So he looked at things a little bit different. And once I began to know him and spend time with him, you know, I began to say, man, that's a good dude. Uh, is Kia here? Hey, Kia. I know she don't mind me saying this, but she was the same way with my partner. I think one day Kia was looking at him like, I just kill you. You know? But then later on, she said, man, Blank is a good guy. He has a good heart. You see what I'm saying? So let's erase that divide. And let's get into this word of God. And allow the word to convict and condemn and to build. Amen? Amen. Amen. A any more questions? Yes, sir. God bless you. Yes, sir. I got a cousin in this stuff. They always say, you know, black power, black power. So um, I was thinking if Jesus was black, uh, would it be the black people that murdered him? And so <laughs> it, I don't look at souls and stuff like that because I have passion for so many people. So my question is this. Uh, with Noah, Jesus said the same way in the end time is going to be like in the day of Noah. Eight souls were saved. So can I get more clarity on that? Uh, do we take that literally? Well, I mean, when you look at you got to go study Noah. Noah was out uh, basically telling everybody it's finna rain, and it never rained before. People looking at him like it's stupid, mm -hmm. and the Bible say they was just doing their own thing, partying and carrying on until it started raining, and that gate was closed. So it's going to be the same way when Jesus split that sky. You know, people are going to be doing their own thing. You're going to have preachers he's coming back and uh man yeah you know and then when it happened it's too late you know uh 
when I read that, I believe that that's what they're saying. If you want to interject? Uh, at all? Yeah, let me like actually read the verse. This is the NASB. Uh, for the son, the coming of the Son of Man. So when Jesus returns, right? For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like in the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will be the coming of so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So that's Matthew twenty four. 37 through 39. So, yeah, a couple of things just to note. I mean, it, it's, it's describing, oh, they were partying it up and having fun and, and ignoring what, what the prophet from God had to say, right? And then, boom, the, the flood came. And, and so it'll be like that when Jesus returns. You're going to have all these people partying up, eating, drinking, being given in merit, whatever, and they're going to realize it's... Too late. It's too late, yeah. And so, you know, I, I wouldn't want to take that too literally and be like, you know, uh, Noah and his son, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their wives or whatever <laughs> were the only people saved. So there's only, you know, Jesus is using it as a metaphor to describe what the com his second coming will be like. Everybody's partying, ignoring God, living a life of sin, and then God's going to come. And, you know, in, in Revelations, it, in Revelation, it says they'll crowd to the rocks to crush them, to hide themselves from the wrath of God. I mean, that's some serious... I mean, so that it's it's going to be like that, um, not for Christians, of course, because we've been saved from judgment, right? So, um, that, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, good. Any more? Any more questions before we close? Yeah. Amen. Well, man, I I really enjoyed this. Yeah, this is you great. Know, yeah, we we're gonna do a lot more. Uh, and send us questions if you or yeah. topics you want us to cover. Yeah. Because this is this is always more fun than me just getting up here and <laughs> you know, like, well, it was apologetic. No, 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 no. And you know uh, I mean? we we also got a podcast coming. What Joel does, uh, uh, we, we're getting them. We're going to get the multi-purpose room finished, uh, and and we're going to set it up in there, and it's going to be a podcast. So man, um, you know, we we want more dialogue questions. You know what I mean, and um, no no question is a dumb question. You know, inbox me, inbox Pastor Joe, um, inbox Ambassadors Assembly uh, platform on uh, Facebook, and and whatever other social media platforms we may have. And uh, man, we, we're going to answer them next week. We're gonna we're gonna dig a little deeper into some some more questions and some stuff. <laughs> you can text me, uh, text Pastor Joe, Pastor Al, any other pastors here, leaders. Your friends, con congregates, whoever, put it on a card. Don't sign your name, whatever. But we we want to be able to cater to to you all and 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 answer those questions, and and allow God to to be glorified through it. Amen. 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 So come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. And, uh,